Hello, everyone. All right, so I think we're about to start. Um, the question today is, uh, why is there no free software vulnerability database? And uh, I'll be your tormentor together with, with Michael Razog. We both work in a small company called Nexby, and we deal with uh, software composition analysis primarily. So the question really is, why is there no free uh, vulnerability database, right? Why? Uh, weirdly enough, the database in that space are mostly proprietary and privately maintained. Um, and it's surprising because most of the information you find in this database are about free and open source software code. And it would make sense that the data about free and open source software could be up in itself. And um, so we'll discuss a bit uh, the, the specifics and I'll present you how we're working to build a series of tools, which are themselves free and open source, to build a free and open source and open data uh, database of uh, open source component vulnerabilities. Um, and hopefully the, the benefits will be improved security and, and uh, for software applications and using open tools and open data for everyone. So one way to think of it is there, there's no reason to put a tax on oxygen, especially in this time where uh, this is really important. And I feel really that uh, putting a tax by having only proper solution for security is a bit like if you were to put a tax on oxygen. Uh, by the way, so while we while we talk, don't hesitate to uh, put questions in the, the Q&A system. Uh, Michael is monitoring those. I'll, I'm watching them too. Uh, I'll pause anytime uh, if you have questions. Uh, uh, otherwise, we'll try to answer them all at the end um, as you go. Okay, so you're probably aware that components with a known vulnerability. So that means there's a known bug which could be exploited uh, and uh, be a threat to, to, the, main, to the, the integrity and the security of a software application is, is one of the, the top 10 OWASP, it's the Open Web Application Security uh, Project, uh, considered as one of the top 10 uh, most critical application security risks. And there's been a lot of widely publicized uh, breach around uh, OpenSSL, struts, uh, and, and the likes over the last couple of years. The, the thing is that it's surprisingly difficult to, to, to actually identify which of the software packages uh, that you have that are uh, subject to these vulnerabilities. And, and there's several reasons. One of them is that most of the tools uh, and database have historically been designed primarily for use with proprietary software components. For instance, uh, is there a bug in Adobe Acrobat or is there a bug in Windows um, that could have a secret impact? And so that's one thing. The other thing is that the, the, the data source is not very comprehensive most of the time. It's, it's difficult because, as, as you may know, there's tens of millions of uh, open source repository on GitHub. Uh, you have hundreds of thousands of uh, Python, uh, JavaScript node, Java packages. Uh, uh, in each of these repositories, and in aggregate, uh, millions and millions of versions. Um, and there's no really easy way to get at the data for all of, all of these. You have, in some case, package repositories, uh, but the information is really scattered in many places. And you have these efforts from um, the Department of Commerce and the NTI in the US called the National Vulnerability Database, or NVD which is trying to aggregate and has been doing a great job for a very long period of time uh, 
to aggregate all the data about known vulnerabilities of software package. It's actually the problem there is that it's dependent on, on voluntary submissions. And you have two cases or you may not be aware of that, that you may not submit anything. Uh, or you may not want to publicize your security issues there, maybe because they still need to be worked out. And, and, and it's a bit especially true for smaller projects um, when this information may not be uh, readily available. And so basically, as we see more and more free software being used as the, the essential building block of all the, the software we use today, we need a way to efficiently identify which FOSS package we have and what are the security vulnerabilities such that we can weed out at least an easy, uh, most likely easy win to uh, identify potential security issues. There's many other areas to work on for security, but at least that's the way I see it, a fairly low hanging fruit that, that we could uh, uh, attack. And ideally, the approach should be based, as I said, we're talking about free and open source software, uh, the, the approach, the tools and the data, all of that should be based on open data and, and, and free software tools. All right, so let's dive a bit now, a uh, bit more in details on the, the NVD. So it's been maintained by the, the US Department of Commerce. They, they've contracted, I think, MITRE Corporation to help them specifically on the creation of incoming vulnerabilities so they can be reviewed, scored, eventually uh, uh, enriched with extra metadata. Uh, but one of the things that's pretty typical there is uh, it reflects a very commercial vendor-centric uh, point of view uh, when you think about security. A very simple example, uh, each package is identified with something called a CP, which I think stands for Common Platform Enumeration or Common Product Enumeration. And one of the essential key in this product identifier is a vendor identifier, which makes a lot of sense if you think about Adobe Acrobat Reader. So Adobe being the vendor, Acrobat Reader being the product, or Microsoft, Windows 95, Microsoft being the vendor, Windows being the, the product. It makes a lot of sense to a vendor. Uh, it, it doesn't really make a lot of sense when you think about a package, uh, an open source package. Uh, if you're using it in the context of uh, a Linux distro, is the distro the vendor or is it the packager? Um, do you care about upstream? Uh, is this something you've used and built from source? There's many different things and really are you using a fork, is it patch? All these matter a lot from a security perspective uh, and not on that, none of that is really captured easily in this notion of uh, a vendor. Um, so the other thing is that uh, there's a lot of independence mismatch also between that naming uh, convention for um, identifying software components and, and what software developers think about, you know, if I'm building a node based application using JavaScript, I think about uh, the name and the version of my node package and maybe just the name and not even the version, maybe I'm using the latest. Uh, I can think in terms of uh, package, be they RPM, Debian, if I'm thinking about an Linux distro, um, but I hardly think in the, the, the same way I would think about large, uh, commercial software components. And uh, there's other thing also is that there's, there's a lot of data which are of much less of interest uh, to us when you, you, when I mean us, I mean when we do software development using components which are heavily and essentially based on open source software, such as hardware. You know, it's, I'm sure it's very interesting for a software researcher to know there's a hardware vulnerability in a Cisco router, but that's not super useful uh, um, when you build a Java-based application. And as we said earlier, there's two issues in terms of uh, the data. First, it's 
contribution based on vulnerability contribution uh, voluntary contribution sorry so that's the first problem so we don't have the full subset the full set of uh, non vulnerabilities only a subset there are several sources that may not be covered there you could very much have had the bug that was entered on the bug tracker which happened to be tagged there as a secret issue it was fixed and closed that security issue will go unnoticed maybe except in a change log um, and you may not be aware um, that you're using an older version and there's a newer version that has a security fixed uh, security issue fixed and and so that that can go unnoticed and again that's a difficult thing to to have all these source of data being aggregated and the other thing is that there's a uh, this cottage industry or uh, more than a cottage industry of uh, commercial vulnerability uh, data aggregation industry and they tend to uh, fragment also the, the problem even more because they're, they're trying to bring their own secret sauce saying oh we have our own vulnerabilities which are very unique and you can only get a, get these vulnerabilities they're not public you have to get them from us and you can really only make uh, uh, leverage these if you buy a subscription to our services, which, which again, I think is, I, I understand the impetus from a commercial uh, development perspective, but I think from a strict uh, uh, perspective of security, this is detrimental to the overall security, it's detrimental to the open source community at large, it's definitely detrimental to the software industry. So, what would be a solution? So, element of a solution would be to independently aggregate many software vulnerability data source in a way that's based on open source code and that can be recreated if needed in a decentralized fashion. And that can also be easily, if we build that data source centrally, easily distributed, replicated, mirrored uh, without any restrictions. Um, we, we've also thought about having a different and more useful, more useful from a software developer's perspective, way to uniformly identify software packages. And it's something called package URLs. Um, that's something you can see on GitHub. It's, uh, it's an initiative that started uh, a couple of years ago. Uh, the problem was simply to say, how can I identify a package in the simplest way, uh, whether it's a node package, a Debian package, a PyPy package, and so on. And we came with a very simple solution that's been adopted uh, by a WASP, a uh, couple projects like Dependency Check and Dependency Track, it's been adopted by Sonatypes, uh, and, and I think there's been discussion at uh, Red Hat, OpenSight, Open, yeah, OpenShift, sorry. Uh, and, and a few other places, there's discussion to use it uh, in SPDX. There's even discussion uh, at the NTIA to use that as an identifier, as a future replacement for the common platform in enumeration. So that's the second element. Aggregate data, second element, an identifier that you can easily, to relate, easily relate to and that can be uh, used uh, uniformly across all the different package types. And that's something that's really easy for a software developer to relate to. And the third element is uh, automating the search for known package vulnerabilities. And it's really enabled by, by this, this uniform package identifier. And last, but that's for later, um, is to actually crowdsource and peer review the classification and the tagging of these, uh, these vulnerabilities. And that's really important because some things may be really noisy and there's an incentive for commercial vendors to have the bigger, larger, uh, most comprehensive database of everything. So there's an incentive to have more information and more data items in their database. Now, that means also there's more false positives, more noise. You could have, for instance, a vulnerability highly rated which is only, uh, there's one, for instance, on Django, which is a web application framework on Python. Uh, 
It's rated as a top level security uh, criticality severity. And it only uh, is triggered if you run in production this web application framework in debug mode, which is something you seldom ever do. That would be a big mistake. And okay, if you do that, then effectively you're in debug mode, you're opening the whole uh, the whole box to the outside world, but that's something rare. And that's probably not something you would want to have flagged systematically each time you have a uh, detection of Django being used as a Python application uh, in, a, in, a kind of, uh, in any kind of web application, which is a pretty common package. So it's important to be able to review and crowdsource this peer review. Um, all the vendors in that space will tell you, but no, you know, it's really a lot of work to do this review. It's complicated. It requires highly special skills. Um, in practice, I think it's something that's possible. I'll come back a bit later on that. Okay, so the solution, as I said, open. And so we're building a tool which is free and open source software to, to automate the, the vulnerability search. That's the last element. So you can find based on data, whether they're based on package manifest or install package database. Think about an RPM database uh, in, in a Linux uh, box or Debian status file um, or package manifest like a package.json or a Maven pom.xml. So being able to uh, normalize these and find the information that tells you I have this package installed. Uh, and normalizing that to uh, this package URL. So we have a tool open source called ScanCode Toolkit, but as I said, there's also a WASP tools, which also support the same standard, meaning that by supporting this common uh, identifier for packages, we can build a database that not only comes with its own pre-built pre uh, free software tools, but also can be plugged in already right out of the box in existing pretty popular uh, flagship tools from the OWASP projects, uh, I think commercial and or open source tools from Sonatypes and, and many more. Um, other things we're thinking for the longer term is we're building eventually a graph of how packages and vulnerability relate to each other. And we want to be able to use that to uh, find a new interesting correlations between vulnerability and software uh, uh, package that are uh, present in the graph. Um, yeah, so excellent example. So there's a question that just came in uh, and there's effectively uh, talking about false positive a lot of vulnerability scanners that report distribution packages being vulnerable. Uh, even though most of the distribution, what they do uh, is that they apply the patches pretty diligently and they backport the fix so they can release it, even though they may not use the latest version of the package. Uh, and so the question is, how do you track the vulnerability fix in this, this context? The, the answer is very simple, is that with a package URL, we have actually, we're tracking that in the case of a distro down to the patch level and not only to the upstream version. So for instance, say uh, you have a package URL that will identify OpenSSL upstream. It could be OpenSSL 101G. And let's say that the corresponding Debian package would have a, a, a build appended to it, it's build eight which happens to be patched for a certain vulnerability, we would track that information at that level of detail. So we know that this version of the package, even though it's the main, the same as the main version of OpenSSL, which has a known vulnerability, this one doesn't have it because it's been patched. Uh, and, and talking about uh, 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 not only correlation, so it's interesting to know that it's derived from OpenSSL as a main version. It's also really interesting to know at the very fine level of detail that this is a version that's been fixed. Uh, we will come down, there's some discussion we've had the, with the, the rest of the team, which is to potentially come down to the level of 
what is the commit that fixed a given vulnerability that we could track? Because when you have that, you could even verify semi-automatically semi, semi that if we have a patch that's been applied, does it match the information we have in the diff from the commit that's supposed to fix the, the, the bug upstream? So we can, we can discuss a bit more about that uh, in a sec. Okay, so package URL. Uh, the simplest way to understand that is just to look at the, the few strings in the middle. PKG column is the URL scheme, if you think about uh, HTTP or HTTPS. And then the rest until the at sign is the namespace and name. After the at sign is the version. And there's, there's also uh, minutiae to it, but that's the, the gist of it. You would wonder why do we have a PKG prefix we, we've summoned a few uh, of the URL authorities from the W3C and the WAT working group. And they really recommended us to use a URL prefix to make sure uh, we could register that with YANA and, and uh, not be having to register many different uh, schemes otherwise. The first iteration, we're using npm colon as a prefix, pypy colon, and so on. So there was an explosion of uh, of uh, URL schemes. And so the thing is that we, we have a common way to identify each package manager, platform type, and ecosystem. Uh, even though each of them have their own, their own, uh, their own ways and their own convention. And the conventions are very similar, but they're subtle difference. And we're just trying to abstract that. Uh, it's very easy to understand what this URL means. And, and they prove very useful. They're very simple and minimalist in their simplest way. So the simple is easy. You can, with a few extensions that you can check in the spec, eventually do complex things down to identifying a file in a package or a specific commit level, all that in a simple string. And that's been proven pretty useful and pretty, pretty popular so far. Um, not only in security, but everywhere where you need to identify packages and understand the origin of a, of a package. Um, as I said, so it's already been adopted in OWASP projects, in particular dependency check, dependency track. I think it's also used in the Cyclone DX bomb spec. It's used in, uh, or considered for using, for usage, I think, in the next version of the uh, software product data exchange, SPDX project at the Linux Foundation. It's used in a tool called ORT, Open Source Review Toolkit, uh, in ScanCode, which is a tool I maintain, and, and, and a few others. And as I said, it's also considered uh, by the NTIA, uh, which has a big effort these days to develop a standard for the soft, a software bill of material, a, aka SBOM. And they're not super happy with uh, uh, the possibilities of the CPE, and they're, they're considering package URL together with several others as a possible alternative, or uh, if not an alternative, something that could go along with CPs. And uh, so that's pretty, pretty, pretty interesting. It was introduced about two and a half, three years ago now, probably three years in, uh, I think it was introduced at first then in 2017. Okay, and, and the god of life system are not with us. I don't have access anymore to, uh, uh, I cannot click next on the slide deck. Okay, so I guess we've lost connectivity. Um, uh, so I don't know if uh, Michael, can you hear me? All right. I Michael, hear you. you I should don't be able... see a way to. Okay. Yeah, I, I can. Can somebody you, ask? A... The, uh... yeah. yeah, I don't seem to have control anymore on the slides. That's okay. I can instead maybe share my screen. Oh, now, now you've got it. Now you've got a your slide advanced. Oh, my slide did advance? Yes. I, I don't have any feedback there, so I don't know where is it. 
Right now, I'm looking at the, the package pro. Line. No, you're on the aggregation okay. slide live. All right. Okay, aggregation. Okay, so if you can advance, so stay on aggregation for now, and I'll. I don't have feedback there on my side. Um, I hope I hope I can be heard remotely too. Um, yeah, we can hear you. Okay, so aggregation. Mm -hmm. So what we do is is, is uh, technically reasonably simple. We collect and parse many data sources in a common data model, and that means uh, trying to find a common ground to identify a package. We discuss about package URL and identify vulnerabilities, and and that's really that's actually something which is surprisingly difficult because uh, beyond something called the CV, the Command Vulnerability Enumeration, which is uh, the, the thing managed by the National Vulnerability Database, there's a surprising number, large number of, of references to talk about that same vulnerability. And as we discussed before, it's really important to, to have this right because uh, uh, otherwise you may uh, reference things that, that are either noise or things that you may miss. So uh, the way we go about that is building cross references. And, and eventually this creates some kind of a, a graph where we reference packages, the version that's affected by a vulnerability, the version where a vulnerability is fixed, and all the different references, and references between packages and eventually references between vulnerabilities themselves. So the main source for that are things like uh, uh, Linux distro trackers, such as uh, Debian, Ubuntu, Red Hat, SUSE, Gen2. Uh, and we have different formats, either it's custom, sometimes CVRF or Oval, which are two more structured uh, XML-based formats. Uh, we have application package trackers, which provide secret information, uh, such as for Nuggets, Rust, uh, Ruby Gems, or NPM. And then you have specific projects uh, for that provide specific trackers. So you have, for instance, in the case of OpenSSL upstream, you have an XML file which describes all the vulnerabilities known for each of the specific versions of OpenSSL. And again, they may be the same or they may be different from the version of the same package that would be available in Linux distro or that may be vendored or bundled inside, say, I don't know, uh, some kind of security tool that, that would be using uh, that tool. And of course, the national NPD, NVD itself, plus, and that's a bit less uh, uh, less obvious, but that's pretty intuitive when you think of it, all the bug trackers of all the packages and the change logs may contain information that can be really interesting about security, you know. Uh, again, you may have a developer that just enters a ticket saying, hey, I think we have a problem there and it may be a security issue and then it's fixed. And then you have an entry in the change log that says, oh, fix bug, foobar, which was a security issue. And, and there, uh, this information usually gets lost. And you say, well, okay, it's not a big deal. But if you're using the previous version and you're not aware that there's a new version that has a security fix, you don't have a direct incentive to update, especially if together with the security fix there's a few feature changes, which means that you have to adapt and, and update your code. You may not want it all to, to update right away. If you were to know that there is a security fix that's been updated, then you probably would more likely uh, tackle the issue earlier than not. And so on the aggregation side, there's, there's an, uh, an interesting problem actually I've not listed here, which is the, the notion of license. Um, because, because there's so many commercial interests in this world of uh, uh, vulnerabilities, there's a lot of weird licensing even for open data. Um, I think the SUSE vulnerability feed uh, is using some kind of non-commercial license, which prohibits commercial usage. Uh, CC BY or, yeah, I think it's a CC BY NC of sorts. 
I have to see. I don't want to pick on Susie specifically, but uh, I have that on top of my mind. Um, there's a feed of uh, data that's been created by a project called PyUp, which is also a commercial company, and and they provide vulnerability data for for Python packages, and it's made available under a non-commercial license. And we don't want to prohibit commercial usage. You know, I think, as I said earlier on. Uh, security information about non vulnerability should be like oxygen. We don't want to put any tax on that, be it for open source use or commercial use. Um, and so we, we, there, there was a project, well, not a project. There was at some point of time, a company called Snake, uh, which is a commercial vendor in the space provided a free and open data feed under the Afero GPL license, which is a very unpractical license for data in general. Uh, so it was raising a lot of issues, both the fact to have copyleft data on the one end and to have a software license applied to data made it really impractical to use. Uh, and they were selling commercial license at the same time for the same data, uh, which is the typical case. So we have also to track the license of each of the data feeds we aggregate because of that. I, I wish we wouldn't have to do that, uh, but that's a fact of life. So we can be sure in the end that the, the overall aggregate is under license that's freely redistributable and that's well known and that's this clear provenance and tracing of all the data item we have and that when we all start working on creation and including peer review, uh, that also there's no ambiguity about the provenance of that data. And frankly, that's really something I was expecting to avoid entirely, but we, we ended up having to, to track the data item license, uh, at least at the source level. Okay. Yeah, sleep so, by the slide. Sleep on the data model. Yeah, so, yes, data model. That I was about to say data model. And, and again, I don't have uh, feedback at all on my side. So data model. Uh, the data is model is extremely simple. It has evolved a bit and we have a lot of discussion on a regular basis to evolve it and change it. But essentially, you have a notion of some kind of abstract vulnerability on the upper left. And you have many vulnerability references. Each of them are essentially uh, a source, a reference ID, and a URL. So you could think about a CVE as coming from the NVD as a source. You have CVE 2020 uh, 1234 as a reference ID and eventually a URL that points exactly to that vulnerability record would be an example of reference. And, and that way we can have many of these references, as many as needed. Uh, there's been a fashion, I guess, in the security world to create many of these IDs. Uh, so Red Hat, uh, for instance, has the uh, uh, RHSA, Red Hat Security Advisory, to use a three or four letters prefix and then a number. It's something that's been, for whatever reason, very fashionable, very popular among uh, security vulnerabilities. So you end up having, for a security issues, a lot of different references. What you don't see here is things about scoring. And there's a standard uh, from the National Vulnerability Database, which is called CVSS, the Common Vulnerability Scoring System. There's different versions of that. The interesting thing is that scoring a vulnerability is really something which is uh, highly subjective. And you can see the same vulnerability with the same scoring system being scored differently uh, at the NVD or by a vendor. So it's important we're also tracking, starting to track now all these scores and, and the different values you can have. And eventually we'll come with our own to join the party because, you know, if there's many scores, why not have one more? Uh, that's a joke. Uh, but eventually we want to have community reviewed, peer reviewed scoring. Uh, but the thing is we, we also have to track all these different systems. And then on the right side, you have package and package reference with package URLs. And eventually you, you may have a package that has many different package URLs because it may live exactly the same in different place, or it may be an entirely different package uh, that's related to the same vulnerabilities. And in between the two, in the middle, very simply, you want to track what's the impacted package, what's the resolved package. 
In most cases, uh, what you care is really these two information in the middle. I have a package URL, which is a known package I use, be it an application or system package. And I want to know what's my impacted and resolved package. All right. If we want to go to the next slide, I guess. Yeah, I put the next. Yeah, we're on vulnerable code. Yeah. Yeah. So the, the project is called Vulnerable Code. Uh, it's available on GitHub. Uh, there's a channel on Gear uh, that's also available through IRC if you want to join. Um, weirdly enough, uh, it's been inter well, not weirdly enough, but interestingly enough, it's been partially so it's partially supported and funded by NextB, which is a US-based company uh, where both Michael and I work. It's also uh, we, we've received a grant uh, from the European Union through uh, the NLNet, uh, which is a non-profit foundation for the development of security and the internet in, in Holland. And we also are supported by internships with the Google Summer of Code program. Um, and we're starting to reach a level where the code and the data will, will start to be usable and, and quite, quite, uh, quite, quite usable pretty soon. Um, and if we go to the next slide. Um, yep. So the, the features we're, yeah, the features here is, uh, uh, what we're looking for is, is search. Very simply, you have a package URL which says, I use foo.1 and I want to know, is it vulnerable? Does it has a known vulnerability? What, what these are? What is the severity of that vulnerability? What's the version to fix? And again, that's a very simple question, but weirdly enough, it's super hard to get an easy and crisp answer today. Uh, in the future, we're looking, and we've discussed also with a, a few other projects about finding out which commit introduced a bug and which commit has a fix. Or something which would be interesting, which is, is this code, be, be it in source or vulnerability format, is it vulnerable? And, and provide something uh, down to the level of the RL, the same way with uh, uh, Snort, uh, or if you think about OpenVAS, where you have uh, uh, detection systems, actually, Nessus, not Snort. Uh, you have role systems, uh, typically focused on network traffic. Here, what would be interesting is have a set of Yarrow, which is a tool uh, from Google, an open source tool to discover patterns and virus like malware in code, uh, being able to identify, is this piece of code vulnerable? Think about the example I gave earlier on for Django. So say we find you have Django in your code base. Uh, latest version happens to be vulnerable like every other version with a super dangerous uh, thing, which is if you run Django in debug mode, then you're subject to this vulnerability. Now, if we have a rule which is able to check not only that you have Django, but check your settings files and check whether the debug flag is turned on or off, then if we can identify it's turned on, we can say, okay, this deal vulnerability, if it's turned off, no noise, no report of the vulnerability, no flagging whatsoever. And I think that's that's not something you can automate, right? Maybe there's a few helpers we can have, but in the end, it's it's about creating this manually. So the power of uh, uh, the community coming together to help generate these, uh, we're not talking about crazy volumes, probably a couple hundreds uh, a, a day at most, and probably much less than that. So if you want to go to the last uh, slide, uh, next slide on uh, curation, yeah, we're showing curation. Yeah, so which is what I talked earlier on. So we, we want to expose this data uh, with a public curation queue for everyone to review. And you have a lot of security researchers which are working on this on a, on a daily basis. Uh, and rather than doing each of the each of them to work on their own side, it would be much better for them to spend the same time, but then it's shared by everyone. So where someone spent an hour uh, privately uh, to qualify the security vulnerability of uh, an open source package, 
Now, if that person spends one hour uh, but contribute that to, to everyone, uh, we hope that uh, there is a possible very virtuous system where we can really create security commands which are of higher value to everyone. And the key creation items could be as simply as val validation. Is there really a vulnerability? What are the correct package URLs? And getting back to your question earlier on, uh, uh, then uh, uh, that would be ensuring that we know that, okay, OpenSSL 101G upstream is vulnerable, but the Debian package on Ubuntu for 101G-3 is not vulnerable. That's the kind of thing. And again, there's potentially ways to automate some of it. That's great. If we can automate, we'll automate the max. But in practice, this is uh, not super high volume and complex enough that it's really valuable to have a community and human review and peer review uh, of this. And we talked about commit and error rules. And of course, uh, uh, severity and scoring, uh, which, which I think can be highly contextual. Because if you think about, again, this uh, uh, non-fictitious Django example, uh, you have the case where the same package has the same volume in both cases, and the code execution path you have based on settings matters a lot. OK, uh, let's go to the challenges. Um, yep, there. From so, the yeah, so uh, at this stage, what we have in terms of, of challenges, there's, there's really a lot of different data sources. They're both messy, redundant, unstructured, or structured, uh, mostly incomplete. And frankly, we came to appreciate the complexity of the task. And, and why there's commercial vendors that currently dominate the space. Because it's it's not trivial. It feels like a simple data aggregation problem, but it's 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 not easy and, and there's much more work than we thought that they were originally. Doesn't mean it cannot be done. And, and frankly, the thing is that yes, there's a lot of data source that are written on structure messy and incomplete. Yet once you've tackled one of these data sources and made sense of it, uh, there's not much of work, extra work to do uh, beyond reviewing the new items that come in, which is where the, the creation comes in. The other thing is that uh, there's a lot of old, obsolete, and less useful data out there. Um, and it's further than promoted somehow by the commercial vendors, because they always want to be, uh, you know, have, a, have a bigger thing. Uh, and here we think it's it's really bigger is not always better, especially who cares about old vulnerabilities on, on older versions of Acrobat or Windows, you know. So they will make your security database much bigger. The likeliness they have a practical usefulness today is low. Uh, so it's noise. Um, so for now, the stance we're taking is to exclude commercial only software and hardware. We may in the future uh, and none of it in the code or the, the data models pr pr prohibits us to do that. It's just we want to be laser focused on the problems at hand we, we are trying to tackle, which is open source software vulnerabilities with open data and open code. Okay, if we put on the future plans, we're running out of time. Yes. Yeah. Uh, so. Uh, yeah, yeah, so future plan. So uh, we're adding more data source. We are about to establish a, a, a website, uh, but we also have an API for data convention, con consumption. Uh, we're looking in the future also at applying some artificial intelligence and, and lightweight machine learning. Not so much to do any kind of fancy stuff, but to spot inconsistencies in the data and, and guide data quality improvement. And so it's more statistics and, and uh, uh, that than really deep machine learning and AI. Uh, we'll need to establish a community creation system. And we're, we're trying to reach also to a few free and open source software project. Our intention, again, we don't want to own that in particular. We want to work with uh, uh, package management communities, 
with larger projects, with foundations, just to make the data available to every everyone and eventually being sourced when it's prime and, and had shown uh, shown to everyone that it's valuable, uh, that, that thing can be a, a really valuable community asset. Okay, Philippe, why don't you talk to the sustainability and then we'll have a few questions in the queue. Yeah, Go ahead. so sustainability, so we, we're looking at building some kind of consortium to make sure that these data are uh, sustainably available to everyone for the long run. It's not only for vulnerabilities, but also uh, uh, everything about software composition analysis. And if you think about it, the, the key is you want to know where software comes from and then interesting attributes about the software would be things like what are known vulnerabilities? What is the license? Are there bugs, quality, or other things of interest about a software package? All that is enabled by being able to know what is the software origin at first. And we've started discussing with other projects like Fasten uh, and Eclipse Steady, which uh, provides uh, quite a bit of uh, uh, deep introspection in Java and, and uh, Python packages, uh, OWASP, uh, and again, OWA uh, upstream and package community is uh, something we, we want to include once we've primed the pump and the system for, for everyone to join. And uh, that's it. So if you want to join, uh, you will be really happy if you want to participate. So we had a, uh, a question about the slides. My understanding is the slides uh, will be posted with the conference materials. Um, not exactly sure of the timeline for that. If you want them more urgently, uh, you can send a, an email to info at nextb.com and we'll be glad to send them uh, right away. Uh, info at nexb.com. And we had a couple questions. One question, Philippe, was how do you use the Yara rules? I don't know if that's... Well, so Yara rules is, is a technically it's 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 a very simple thing. You search for patterns or string. Think about like a regular expression, or in a more sophisticated way, like a virus signature. Actually, internally Yara is a tool that can recognize many patterns at once, like a virus detection tool like Clamavi or any of uh, commercial virus scanners or like Snort, which is specialized in intrusion detection. And so these patterns are small strings, which could be text or byte strings. And what we want to do there is uh, create several of these rules that allow to identify either the presence of a specific binary. So something think uh, you have OpenSSL. So there's a version string maybe in OpenSSL that show up in plain text inside a shared object. That could be a way to figure out, okay, using OpenSL 1G. Now, we may be identify, able to identify with byte signatures, what is the signature that has been introduced by a specific bug? It's not trivial. You know, it requires eventually reversing, understanding exactly the binary code, but there's ways to build these kind of rules. And that means you would know, okay, I know I have OpenSSL 101G, I know that the code in question uh, that's vulnerable with CV uh, 2020, uh, this and that, is not there. It's not present because we don't have the signature for that. It's not foolproof. It's never perfect, but it's much better than just looking at binary and wondering whether is it good or is it bad. We had one other question about the package URL, but I think you've fairly well answered that, at least as far as we can at this level of detail. Um, so I think that covers. I think. There's a quick no, There's a question also about. Uh, uh, so Leonidas is asking uh, if we have some way to tag uh, standard pattern tag in the way project fixes these issues. Well, yeah. So. The, the thing is that, yes, that would be ideal. It's difficult to, to have each of these community change their ways. And the, the difficulty is that 
security bugs are fixed, uh, uh, not specifically as security bugs in many occasions. So they just go as part of the regular flow of uh, uh, fixing other bugs in many cases. And, and therefore, if they're not even identified as such uh, beyond just the change log mention, it's, it's hard for ways to, to, to tag and so on. Now, to your point, Leonidas, one of the way that probably would be the most uh, prolific, if we could find some way to unify uh, ways on how security issues could be reported, would be not to track uh, uh, a whole uh, or every distros. I mean, each of them have already pretty structured ways which work okay at the Linux distro level. But think about the whole package ecosystem, uh, say PyPy or Maven, uh, where we can probably work with the package uh, creators, community, and the, the, the authors of the package management tool, the maintainer of the package registry to evolve norms that work for that community and that provide a better way to, to identify this, uh, this thing. And again, to, to the point, uh, yes, there's old version numbers in many distros. Uh, but uh, very often there's a backport. It's but so there's nothing perfect. We hope to the question you've you've you brought up. We hope Lenny does that the data we're bringing together may help uh, in some cases when there's other versions of a package available in distro that's not been backported. That this information is also more readily available without having to look at uh, other distributions or. Uh, look up in the national variety database, but not being able to find the exact package and, and having that, that information lost in translation because of the noise. All right, if there's any other question. So I think we're out of time. So. Yeah, yeah we're, we're done, but if there's any questions, so. Um, so again, uh, if you want to go to the, oh, I have control again. So if you want to go to the vulnerable code project and join the discussion here, let me put that as a last slide that's here. Um, and um, I look forward to, to, to having fewer security bugs in the future. Thank you very much, everyone, and have a good day. Thank you, everyone.